called Song for a Whale by Lynn Kelly. Until last summer, I thought the only thing I had in common with that whale on, a be on the beach was a name. I sat with Grandpa after collecting shells and driftwood scattered along the shore and wildflowers from the dunes. The shells and driftwood were for Grandma, and the flowers were for the whale. Grandpa had asked how school was going, and I told him it was the same, which wasn't good. I'd been at that school for two years and still felt like the new kid. Grandpa patted the sand next to him. Did you know she was probably deaf too? He signed. I didn't have to ask who he meant. The whale had been buried there for 11 years, and my parents had told me enough times about what happened that day. I shook my head. I hadn't known that, and I didn't know why Grandpa was changing the subject. Maybe he didn't know what to tell me anymore about school. The whale had beached herself the same day I was born. When she was spotted in the shallow waters of the gulf, some people stood on the shore and watched her approach. My grandma ran into the cold February water and tried to push her away from land, as if she could make a 40-ton animal change her mind about where she wanted to go. That was really dangerous. Even though the whale was weak by then, one good whack with a tail or a flipper could have knocked grandma out. I don't know what I would have done, jumped in like she did or just stood there. She wasn't born deaf like we were. Grandpa continued, the scientist who studied her said it had just happened. Maybe she'd been swimming near an explosion from an oil rig or a bomb test. When Grandpa told a story, I saw it as clearly as if it were happening right there in front of me. His signing hands showed me the whale in an ocean that suddenly went quiet. Swimming over there, swimming over here, over there, trying to find the sounds again. Maybe that was why she'd been there in our Gulf of Mexico beach, instead of in the deep ocean waters where she belonged. Say whales don't swim so close to shore, only her on that day. A whale can't find its way through a world without sound, Grandpa added. The ocean is dark and it covers most of the earth and whales live in all of it. The sounds guide them through that and they talk to one another across the oceans. With the familiar sounds of the ocean gone, the whale was lost in her new silent world. A rescue group came to the beach and tried to save the whale and they called her Iris. Grandma asked my parents to give the name to me too since I had entered the world as the whale was leaving it. After the marine biologists learned all they could from her, she was buried right there on the beach along with unanswered questions about what had brought her to our shore. We lived on the coast until the summer after second grade, when my family moved to Houston for my dad's new job. Since then, we went back just once or twice a summer. The good thing about our new home was that it was closer to my grandparents, and I liked being able to spend more time with them, especially since they were both deaf like me. But we all missed the beach, and I missed being around kids like me. My old school had just a few deaf kids, but that was enough. We had our classes together, and we had one another. But it's different for us, Grandpa signed. Out here, there's more light, and all we need is our own small space to feel at home. Sometimes it takes time to figure things out, but you'll do it. You'll find your way. I wish I'd asked him how long that would take. I'd come to the conclusion that sending me to the office was Miss <coughs> Khan's only joy in life. That made me responsible for her happiness in a way. But I tried to slip into class without her noticing. I was only a minute late this time and I had a really good reason. She pointed toward the front office before I could even drop in my chair. When I got back to the room with my tardy pass, Ms. Khan said to my interpreter, Mr. Charles, tell Iris to move over next to Nina so she can catch her up. She usually talked around me like that. Mr. Charles had told her so many times that she could just talk to me and he would interpret the message instead of always saying, tell Iris. Finally, he gave up reminding her. She was never going to get it. Also, I didn't need help catching up and I sure didn't want help from Nina. I'll catch myself up, I signed. When Mr. Charles voiced that for Miss Khan, voiced that for Miss Khan, 
Her face turned even meaner than usual, which I hadn't thought was possible. She didn't say anything else, just jerked a pointed finger at the space next to Nina's desk. The plan made sense to Miss Khan because she thought Nina was the smartest person in class, and Nina thought she knew sign language. She had checked out a library book about it, so that made her an expert. Some people have that kind of confidence that lets them get away with being clueless. Nina signed something to me as I slid my desk over to her territory. I asked Mr. Charles, did she just call herself a giant squirrel? He clamped his lips together and looked away while answering, I think she meant great partner. That's what I had figured, but trying to make Mr. Charles laugh was one of my favorite things. I leaned over the next row to look at Clarissa Gold's book. Mr. Charles interpreted my question when I asked Clarissa what we were working on. Nina tried to barge in with her flapping hands and made up sign language. When I ignored her, she got dangerously close to my face, as if I couldn't see her. My eyes stayed on Mr. Charles since he actually did know what he was doing. Nina's hands were like a swarm of flies and I wanted to swat them away. So it felt good to flick the wrist of an open hand to sign stop it to her. After Mr. Charles interpreted that, he added that it might be distracting to have two people signing at the same time. Usually, he didn't jump in like that because he wanted me to take care of things for myself. So Nina must have just been annoying him too. After a few minutes, Miss Khan came by to ask Nina, are you doing okay helping Iris? Yes, I think she's catching on, she answered. Catching on. I looked back down at my work so I wouldn't turn into one of those cartoon characters with steam shooting out their ears. After I scribbled down the last answer in the workbook, I slammed it closed and signed, finished. I was just about to take out my phone so I could read the new issue of Antique <coughs> Radio Magazine. I downloaded it that morning. If I opened a book on my desk, I could probably read some of the magazine by looking down at the phone in my lap. While my hand was sliding into my backpack, Miss Khan said something to me and pointed at her mouth. She'd tried that before, as if that would magically help me understand her. One night at dinner, I told my parents, Hey, I'm not deaf anymore. Miss Khan pointed to her lips while she talked, and everything was perfectly clear. Can't believe y'all never thought of that. On the first day of school, Miss Khan tried to hold Mr. Charles's hand still to force me to read her lips instead of watching his signing. I didn't catch what Mr. Charles said to her, but she let go of his hands like she'd touched a hot stove and didn't ever try that again. We ignored the lip pointing, and Mr. Charles interpreted what Miss Khan said. I'd have to redo my poetry assignment from last week. That didn't make any sense. The poem I turned in was good. When Miss Khan returned with my paper, she looked like she'd just bitten into a sour pickle. A normal expression for her, but right then it looked like she was smelling something really bad at the same time she was biting that pickle. The red ink was the first thing I noticed when Miss Khan handed back my paper. In the margin were the words, this does not rhyme, which wasn't true. That poem came from sign language storytelling game I used to do with Grandpa. One of us would start a story, and then we'd take turns adding to it, one sign at a time. The trick was, our hands had to keep the same shape for the whole story. Like if we started out with a closed fist, every sign for the rest of the story had to be made with a fist too. We'd go on and on like that until one of us couldn't think of something to add without breaking the hand shape rule. My favorite story started with a tree full of leaves. A leaf blew away with a gust of wind and then landed in a river, floated down a stream, and then onto a bank. It ended with a bird swooping in to grab the leaf to add, the nest, add to our nest in another tree. We told that story with our hands open, like the number five, the whole way through. It didn't look the same on paper. Paper is flat, so I couldn't use all the space above and below and around it that I needed to tell the story right. And the words in English don't have the same shapes they do in sign language. But here's how it looked when I wrote it down. Leaves waving, blowing, twirling, flowing current, land on a riverbank, mother bird grabs the leaf and builds a new nest. Sure, it didn't rhyme that way words in English do, but I thought maybe it would be okay to turn it in if I explained all that. At the top of the paper, I'd written a note about the poem. I wonder if Miss Khan had even read that part. A red light crossed through the poem, ruining it. 
I took out my own red pen and glared at Miss Khan. Below her, this does not rhyme message, I wrote, it does to me. Ever since Grandpa died, I wondered if he could still see me, if he was still with me in some way. Right then, I hoped more than anything that he was nowhere near me. I didn't want him to see what Miss Khan had done to our story, to us. Everyone turned and looked at me as I crumpled the paper into a ball. Nina held her finger to a lips, as always, like it was her job to remind me that things made noise and that I wasn't supposed to do any of them. But I did not throw the paper at your face. I flung it across the room where it landed in the trash can, followed by the tree and the leaves and the river and the bird with her new nest, all slashed to pieces by a red line. That was the end of chapter two. Uh, I will tell you that this book continues on with a rebellious grandma, some parents who just do not understand, a whale that can't communicate, and Iris's plan to fix everything.